Thanks for coming uh, today to the lunch seminar. Uh, today, Brett Britman, uh, professor at Cardo uh, Cardozo Law School and also our CITP Microsoft visiting faculty for the year is going to speak to us. Um, Brett uh, uh, teaches uh, in a variety of topics uh, related to um, uh, internet law and policy, uh, technology policy, uh, intellectual property, and so forth. Um, in addition to his uh, positions at CITP, he's also a, a fellow for uh, Stanford and also um, has an affiliation with Davis and Petrino. Uh, and uh, you may or may not know, but he also is an astrophysicist. Uh, well, so I wouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> undergrad. Back in the day. Back, uh, back in the day, day an undergraduate. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so he brings a wealth of expertise to the topic that he's going to talk to us uh, uh, talk, talk to us about today, uh, which is basically what happens when contracts become uh, increasingly digitized and automated. And this I, uh, paper that I think is a preprint to his upcoming book as well. Yep. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Nick. Um, can you hear me? Am I good? Yep. All right. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you about this paper. It's really a work in progress. Um, my co-author Evan and I, uh, Evan Selinger and I, wrote the paper. It's a standalone article, um, and are currently in the process of revising it. So today, I thought uh, not all of these. Uh, sessions have been sort of workshops, but I was actually really hoping to sort of workshop the paper a bit with you guys. Um, so comments, criticisms, suggestions are very much welcome both during the Q&A and afterwards and, and over the next couple weeks if, if, if you like. Um, so the paper is Engineering Humans with Contracts. Um, it's also part of a larger uh, book project um, uh, that I'm working on, Being Human in the 21st Century, How Social and Technological Tools Are Reshaping Humanity. Um, and so Evan and I are steadily working on the book. Uh, we are hoping to complete the manuscript and get it off to Cambridge in the next few months. Um, and so I thought it would help our discussion, help frame the discussion, uh, if I say a bit about the broader book project, um, uh, in part because the paper is going to be a chapter in the book, uh, as I'll explain. Um, and so the, the major themes of the book uh, are, are as follows, up on, the, up on the screen. I mean, we're really interested in trying to figure out uh, and, and discuss and conceptualize when uh, technology diminishes our humanity or what the relationships are between technology and humanity. Um, so in tech policy discussions, there's, uh, are, they're sort of filled with euphoria and pessimism with unsubstantiated claims of uh, impending utopia and dystopia. Uh, and one strand of such claims revolves around um, uh, technologies that allegedly uh, dehumanize us in one fashion or another. Um, so in the book, we examine these types of claims and develop an approach uh, to identifying and evaluating the relationships uh, between humanity and technology. Um, and so uh, we often, you know, we have to deal with things like what makes us human, but maybe more importantly, what matters, uh, what about being human matters to us, and what kinds of things that matter to us about being human are susceptible to engineering through the technologies that we regularly build and use. Um, so this is this the outline or the table of contents of the book, or at least most of it that's appearing on the slide. There's some, there's some things in the way, but don't worry about that. Um, the book is more or less organized into uh, three major parts. Uh, the first of which focuses on engineering humans, um, and it's really about the relationship between humans and the tools that we've, we develop. Uh, and so some of the chapters look historically uh, at, at uh, you know, how we shape our tools and how the sh tools that we develop shape us. Um, the, uh, we focus in particular, th so this first part of the book, first couple of chapters also frame the various themes that were on the prior slide uh, and sort of explain the difficulty that we have in evaluating uh, these persistent claims about technology de being dehumanizing. Um, and then we focus on a particular set of tools uh, that, we've, that humans develop and rely on, and in particular tools for techno-social engineering ourselves. Right, so one of the things that humans do that is quite uh, special uh, is that we develop tools and then we engineer ourselves through the tools that we, we, we develop. Um, and so we look at past, present, and future examples, moving from things like workplaces and schools to mass media, uh, to nudging, to ICTs, and looking to the future, to things like the IO, uh, Internet of Things and, and sensor networks. And one sort of observation we, we draw out in, in uh, I think it's in Chapter 3, um, is, is that if you think about it, much of the techno-social engineering through our tools uh, often has taken place in isolated, independent, discrete contexts and environments, um, but that's increasingly 
that increasingly with, uh, with more modern technologies, it's becoming interconnected, interdependent, continuous, and much more micro and fine-grained and personalized, right? And so some of the things that may have just taken place in a workplace uh, are now sort of we're seeing sort of extended uh, throughout our lives uh, in a more continuous fashion. And so, so those are some of the ideas that uh, developed in the first part uh, of the book. The second part of the book focused more on developing a framework for identifying and analytically evaluating when the tools may be impacting uh, some uh, aspect of our humanity or some capability you might think matters in terms of us being uh, uh, human. Um, and so to do that, we developed a series of human-focused Turing tests. Um, and there's a variety of different tests we develop. Um, and I, I'm just going to assume here at CITP that most of you are more or less familiar with Alan Turing uh, and his famous observational test uh, that he developed for basically tackling the question of whether machines can think. Right? That's the question he posed. And rather than getting bogged down in the definitional difficulties of what constitutes a machine and what constitutes a uh, thinking, um, he developed an observational test. Um, and the point was really, as far as we're concerned, the point is really to identify a remarkable machine, right? A, a machine that's remarkable precisely because it was indistinguishable to an observer uh, from a human being and with respect to a particular capability, in, in that context, conversational uh, intelligence. Um, and so there's really sort of two points. So if you, there's a Turing line, there's a line between machines and humans, it's really evaluating technological progress with respect to machines over time. Um, and uh, there's two points worth observing about that. Humans are used as a baseline, right? It's humans are a baseline with which to evaluate machines. Um, and uh, also that in doing this, uh, Turing did a lot of work in, in essentially constructing a techno-social environment within which to run the test. Right, so the observational tests are set up, and a, and a Turing test is really about constructing an environment uh, using certain stimulus response back and forth to sort of evaluate machines against the baseline of humans, right? So what we're interested in, uh, sort of radical repurposing of the Turing test, is, the, is really the human side of the, of the line. Uh, so I'm not at all interested for the purpose of this project, although I am in, interested more generally, um, in evaluating human-like machines. In other words, I could care less about the fact that there may be a human-like machine or an artificial intelligence that's really sophisticated in a particular, what, this fashion or that fashion. Rather, I'm interested in identifying and evaluating machine-like humans. Okay? So uh, we radically repurpose the Turing test and focus on a variety of different capabilities, not just we begin with and talk about conversational intelligence, but there's a variety of other capabilities that we might think matter and that humans have and that we might think are engineerable or subject to engineering. And at the same time, machine or a simple machines might serve as a baseline simply with which to use as an, ob in an observational style approach or a test. Um, so the approach we take can be extended and applied to a variety of other capabilities beyond the ones that we, we, that we talk about in the book. And in a sense, it's sort of a pluralistic approach to thinking about these, these questions. Um, the analysis, I think, leads to a, a series of slightly different questions than the ones that Turing and people applying Turing tests might have ended up focused on. Uh, and here are a few of them. Um, but in particular, it gets us thinking about and focused on how built or engineered environments function as a tool for techno-social engineering humans within that environment. Okay? And that ends up being sort of a big uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the project that we're undertaking. The, um, okay, so again, we're constructing environments. The, the third part of the book, um, the third part of the book is about major policy arenas where we see implications and applications of the, of the ideas. Uh, but there's plenty of micro applications of the ideas in the theoretical framework throughout the book in earlier chapters, ranging from fitness tracking to menstruation tracking to relationship management to emotion management to outsourcing of memory <clears throat> uh, and, and sensory perception and even mobility. Um, but so, so some of these applications are based on existing technologies. Some of them are based on hypotheticals and thought experiments that are plausible extensions of currently existing technologies or things in development. So the electronic contracting environment is one familiar area 
uh, where some of our concerns that we're raising throughout the book seem quite tangible. Uh, and so it, it's sort of, we, we situate that in the first part of the book, um, and it's, pr it's a sort of a precursor to the Turing stuff, because in a sense, it provides a way to get a sense of the Turing test, right? We may, we may feel like we are uh, behaving like simple stimulus response machines when we respond to the stimulus of a, uh, of a click to agree uh, contract. <coughs> so I'm going to focus on that today, because that was a sort of an interesting way to sort of get you into some of the ideas in the book. Um, so the electronic contracting environment is one uh, is uh, is is uh, shaped is an environment shaped by contract law itself, right? So contract law itself shapes the transactional environments in general, where people formulate legally respected and binding commitments to each other, uh, and how we form relationships. And in general, contract law greatly enhances individual and group autonomy, uh, as well as our ability to relate to each other and to cooperate, right? And so these are really contract law's core normative foundations. Contract law is fundamentally about enhancing, providing tools to enhance autonomy and allowing us to relate to each other effectively. Um, uh, yet, we suggest that contracting practices, at least over the past half century, have, have changed quite a, quite a bit. Uh, in terms of the way it's, uh, in, in, in order to accommodate changes in economic, social, and technological systems. And so in some sense, it may be that contract law, as it is practiced in the electronic contracting context, may be more liberating for some than for others, and in fact may be quite oppressive in various ways. So if, this is a big if, if the electronic contracting environment conditions us, human beings, to behave like simple stimulus response machines, perhaps systemic reform of contract law might be warranted. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about this as we go, but what I want to be very, I want to be very clear about something up front. The argument we're developing in this paper, in this chapter of the book, is not about the goodness or the badness of any particular term in a contract. It's not about the goodness or pa uh, badness of uh, particular outcomes in specific contracts or transactions uh, or cases. Rather, our concern is with the social costs associated with rampant techno-social engineering that devalues and diminishes human autonomy and sociality in general, and of, wh of which the electronic contracting uh, context may just be one of many examples. Um, so the paper has three parts. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up for much of the rest of the, converse uh, uh, the conversation, although uh, uh, it sort of summarizes ma many of the main arguments. But the first part uh, sort of describes the experience of online contracting, uh, as well as argues that the electronic contracting environment should be understood as a techno-social tool for engineering humans to behave automatically, like simple machines. This, the next part describes the problem in Taylorist terms uh, as a system of scientific management of human beings that's directed towards consumers. And so this view emphasizes how consumers, much like laborers in a Taylorist workplace, are conditioned to behave in ways that are largely determined by system engineers uh, and who optimize the environment to meet efficiency standards or productivity standards. And then finally, we argue that if our hypotheses are valid, and again, this paper identifies, is, is a theoretical paper that identifies a series of, we think, possibly testable hypotheses, um, and yet the paper is not an empirical paper. It doesn't test these yet. But if the hypotheses turn out to be uh, true, uh, are valid, we think that significant legal and policy reforms might need to be considered, and at the end of the paper, in the final part, we suggest a few. Uh, so for the talk today, I thought I'd focus mostly on the first two parts um, and leave discussion of the third part to the extent that people are interested to Q&A, where we can certainly get into some of the possible legal reforms. Um, but given that they're tentative and they rest on the you know, testable hypotheses that we're raising, we're not really uh, advancing them, to, we're not pushing them too hard in the paper. <coughs> All right, so. Uh, world A and World B, right? So in her book, wonderful book, Boilerplate, Peggy Radin uh, presents two conceptually familiar worlds. I'm sure these are familiar to all of you. World A, where A stands for agreement, uh, is one in which contracts entail exchanges between parties who actually consent to the exchange, the bargain for exchange, a meeting of the minds in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, right? It's traditionally how many imagine that contracts would work in an ideal world. Right, where you sit across the table and bargain and reach, a, reach, a, reach an agreement. Right? World B, where B stands for boilerplate, uh, is one in which contracts are standard form contracts, right? uh, also known as contracts of adhesion or take it or leave it contracts, 
Um, and this is more often what we actually experience in the real world as consumers. Um, and so the beauty of the internet, right, it's, it, the, this is the scope, the range, the incredibly wide range of various websites, transactions, interactions, communities that, that are available to us. And navigating the web, right, and all of that, and all of that variety uh, brings with it an incredible amount of legal baggage. And so if the internet sort of was modeled on or followed the, the world A uh, vision, right, um, it would be incredibly stifling because of immense transaction and, inf and information costs. And so the job of, of, uh, of lawyers uh, who, who draft boilerplate agreements as well as website designers who architect uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the digital environment is largely in part to reduce that friction, right? Minimize transaction costs, reduce information costs. Um, and so the current scale of private ordering via written boilerplate agreement uh, seems to us to be unprecedented. Okay, so we don't do the empirical work in this paper to measure the number of written contracts that an average person enters into their lifetime, but I, I, I'm going to ask you about it in a second. But just think about that for a moment. How many contracts you've entered into this week or, or in the last month or in the last year? Um, we suggest a couple of hypotheses, though. The first is that the number has steadily, uh, if not exponentially, increased right, um, over the past half century. The second hypothesis is that the rate of meaningful participation in negotiating terms has steadily decreased over the same time frame. And then the third is that the number of written contracts concerning mundane affairs has also dramatically increased. And by mundane, we simply mean ordinary everyday affairs for which a written contract would be cost prohibitive and inefficient, uh, but for the uh, existence of boilerplate. In other words, in the absence of boilerplate, no one would establish a written contract to, to, to mediate those affairs. So if you think about how many written uh, contracts you've entered in into, into in your life, um, it's, it's hard to even count them, right? Uh, if we asked that question 50 years ago, the answer would probably be an order of magnitude, probably orders of magnitude less than what your answer would be today. Um, and in fact, if you think about the future, future readers or future, pe uh, in, in the future, people thinking about trying to answer this question would find the question itself odd. Because the idea of distinct, identifiable contracts is likely to be at odds with the experience of com completely seamless contractual governance. Um, which raises, a, we, we think, a pretty interesting theoretical question. Freedom of contract is kind of contingent on or re requires the correlative freedom from contract. Right? The freedom to enter into a contract as a basic freedom also requires the freedom that you can be uh, outside of contract or deny uh, or, 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 or not, not enter into a contract. But of course, when contract becomes automatic and ubiquitous in terms of mediating our lives, right? Yeah? Is asking a question? I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just broken, lost a little bit. I'm, I'm showing my ignorance in as a loss. So is the contracts that we click when we ignore those things and we just say yes, is that actually exactly as binding as like a marriage contract? Yes. But for, for purposes right. of now, <laughs> for purposes of now, let's just say yes. So it is true some courts have not in, have refused to enforce click to agree you know click through contracts but in general and I'll get to this in a second but yes in in general the when you click i agree you're manifesting your assent to be bound by the contractual terms there are certain legal constraints on whether or not you are there's conspicuous notice of the fact that you're entering into a contract are those terms available to you through a link or something In terms of the basic contract formation question, no. Right. right. So that's 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 the basic the, the the base part of the basic point of the paper is to say that you we've created a system where you're regularly entering into written contracts, right? Um, and they're written and they've generally been enforceable by courts uh, for the purposes of enhancing efficiency and letting transactions kind of go forward. Yeah. There's a contract, but it's not a written contract. So yes, I'm, I am drawing, I should, that's helpful. I am drawing a line, I've, del I've been saying throughout this thing, I've been emphasizing r entering into written contracts. You're right, when I buy a, a, an item from the grocery store, I don't, I am, I have, there is a contract, and if it turns out the thing I bought 
uh, doesn't function well or, or it's rotten or it doesn't, you know, it's food and it's rotten, I can go back and there is a uniform, uniform commercial code and there's, there's an implied contract that I can rely on. So yes, there's a difference between that. I'm, I'm focusing on the written contract in part to talk about the, the importance of the mechanism by which we're assenting. Right, so those are browse wrap contracts, right? They're, they're called browse wrap contracts in the, in the courts. Um, uh, browse wrap contracts in, uh, in and of themselves, court, many court, more courts have found that browse wraps are not enforceable as contracts just because it says by visiting the site if the terms are at the bottom of the, of the, of the site. Um, so they're more suspect at law than the click through. And I'll, and I'll say a little bit about that in a second when I talk about the click through. The, the beauty of the click through from an innovation standpoint is in part that you've got an affirmative act that creates demonstrable evidence that someone acted in a way that manifested consent. Where you've got a browse wrap, the mere kind of going along with reading the pages doesn't have the same, uh, it's not as active, it doesn't have necessarily the same evidentiary effect. That makes sense? Okay. All right, so um, the uh, point I was making is really just that there's, you've, we've, there's a dramatic increase in the number of written contracts that we enter into uh, through, this, through this mechanism, right? So we click a virtual button, and when we click a virtual button, right, the experience is barely notable, right? And it's, the, the argument we make in the paper, at least, is this is a feature, not an accidental bug, right? It feels nothing like signing the dotted line of your mortgage, but the legal effect is more or less the same. And there's some exceptions to this, as we were, just, we were just talking about. But when you click I agree, what you're doing is manifesting consent to be bound to a legal agreement to, some, to, to the, the, the party on the other side. Um, and so the electronic contracting environment we're all familiar with, that we experience pretty regularly, is contingent on both contract law and practice. And in terms of practice, I want to emphasize it's contingent on the technological systems through which we interact, communicate, transact, and form relationships. And I want to emphasize that both could be different, right? Um, we want to avoid, at least in the, in the argument, we, in, the, in the book especially, we want, to, we want to advance this argument. We don't want to fall into a determinist trap, right, that makes us think that what we have now, the path we're on and where we're headed, are somehow natural or inevitable. Uh, as we explore in the book, the trap itself is constructed and engineered. So one, one takeaway from this is beware engineered determinism, right? Don't, just because this is what we're used to, because we, have, we, we do it so often, by no means means it has to be that way. It's a product of the contract law itself and the architecture that we've built. We could build something differently. We can imagine the law differently. So contract law, in, in a sense, is permitted and perhaps encouraged the development of the uh, contracting environment in which it would be irrational for users to read the terms of a contract. The design of the user interface, that is, for example, the click to I agree button coupled with a link to a separate file, that's merely an implementation of what contract law has allowed right, through a series of court decisions. I mean, it's efficient. It's, it's efficient in a sense, right, in the sense that each online contract we enter into is presumably in our interest and cost benefit justified. Otherwise, we'd walk away. Price and service are presumably the driving factors. And you might think that all the, uh, everything else is just a mere transaction cost to be minimized. Buried in terms of service, no, one, no rational person would, would ever read. But again, what exactly is the price? So often we have no idea, right? Often the true price is not money exchanged. Frequently users don't pay money for the services provided. The apparent sticker price is zero. Even when users do pay money, the sticker price often is heavily discounted. Why? Well, because other side payments exist. The actual price users pay for services provided by many websites, not all, uh, but many, includes all of the information collected by the site, the various legal rights waived or that may have been given up, as well as all of the pseudo relationships made with third parties that are lurking in the background. So website users are the objects of various side agreements, quite often. Right, so as people like to say about Facebook and Google, and, and in a second I'll explain why I'm not picking on Facebook or Google about this, uh, but they like to say users are not really the consumers. Rather, users are the product being consumed by all of the advertisers and the other third parties with whom Facebook and Google have side agreements. 
right? That's true. But the point generalizes way beyond Facebook and Google. It describes much of the digital networked environment and thus, I would argue, much of our digital lives, much of our everyday lives. But you might say, look, given the number of users, the number of sites, the number of transactions, and so on, the design of the interface seems perfectly rational. After all, in many offline contexts, consumers don't read most terms, and they only deliberate over, deliberate over a small number of salient variables. That is price, quality, timing. Comparable deliberation in the online context might take too long. It might be too complicated. It might lead to less transactions. It just seems much easier and efficient to hide the complex details and nudge users to click I agree without deliberation over such terms. So in our view, uh, the online contracting regime is a pretty compelling example of how our legal rules, when coupled with a specific technological environment, can lead us to behave like simple stimulus response machines. Perfectly rational, of course, but also perfectly predictable and ultimately perhaps programmable. So the environment, we suggest, disciplines us to go on autopilot. And it helps create, or at the very least reinforces, dispositions that will affect us in other walks of life. Walks of life that involve similar technological environment, which given the direction of innovation and what we call boilerplate creep, surveillance creep, nudge creep, etc., uh, may turn out to be everywhere. So a laundry list of heuristic biases often uh, influence our behavior, right? Sometimes, I, I, I believe, by design, Decision fatigue can be overwhelming. The opportunity cost of slowing down and deliberating can be incredibly high. Um, habits, after all, are incredibly powerful. And so not surprisingly, boilerplate creep continues to creep, right? which only exacerbates the effects as we become more comfortable, complacent, and easier to nudge. And particularly worrisome in our view is how boilerplate creep enables both surveillance and nudging creep. And by creep, what I mean is the slow extension in various dimensions of the use of this tool, right? So boiler, boiler, and I'll give you an example in, ju in just a moment. In fact, there's, there's the next example. So in the book, we explore boiler, play creep, surveillance creep, nudging creep, all as examples of techno-social engineering creep. And so we use a variety of examples of explaining how it happens. Um, Consider, for example, how the electronic contracting environment optimized for websites migrated to mobile devices and apps, and then further to smart TVs, and how it will in all likelihood extend to the, smart, to the Internet of Things. Right? By the time we get there, it'll just be what we're used to. Okay? Um, the parties, the legal relationships, the technologies, the services provided, the data generated and collected, the implications vary dramatically across these contexts. Nonetheless, in general, not always, but in general, our behavior remains the same. Perfectly predictable, seemingly rational, hyper-efficient, check the box, click I agree. The relationships and privacy implications differ substantially, for example, when you shift from a website to a smart TV, don't they? Right? Just stop and think about it for a second. There are different service providers. There are different third-party affiliates in the background. There are different technologies and services. There are different kinds of data. You know, what you do with your kid in your late-night karaoke session in your living room is quite different than what you do when you're on your laptop at the office going to a website. Right? And yet, so you might think, I guess, uh, and perhaps we should, be disposed to deliberate about at least some of these transactions. Perhaps we should stop and think about what we're getting ourselves into. But the argument, or at least the hypothesis, is perhaps we're being conditioned not to do so. So for example, if you decide to actually investigate the privacy policy of your new smart TV, you'll likely see the 1 slash 50 at the bottom of the screen, shrug, click the back arrow, and behave like you're supposed to. So of course, I don't know if you're feeling it, but some will resist this characterization. You'll know, believe that nobody's in danger of mindlessly following scripted programming. You may believe that you really decide for yourself when you click I agree and are in no way pre-programmed to do so. Right? This is a common reaction. We, my co-author and I struggled with this at first when we were kind of thinking this through. But it presupposes, this view presupposes that at some point in your past, you actually consciously adopted a heuristic-based strategy to deliberate once in a while. Right? Uh, or maybe you trust in the markets or the wisdom of crowds, watchdog journalists. 
just want to ask you, what, what justifies that presupposition? Put aside the merits of the strategy. It may make sense. It may be the only thing that makes sense, given the environment and how it's constructed. But ask yourself, like, did you ever really adopt such a strategy based on deliberation about its merits? Do you remember when? I don't. I don't think I ever did. I don't remember it. I'd like to think I did, but I, but I didn't. Optimized environments might be architected to make you feel as though you're making deliberate choices when you're not actually doing so. Just an immediate click can be rational in the immediate context. Trusting markets, wisdom of crowds, watchdogs, and courts can also be the only rational choice across contexts, given the incredible number of interactions that are mediated in exactly the same way. So again, I want to emphasize the seemingly efficient rationality of both the micro, you know, contract by contract, and the macro, st endless stream of contracts that you go through when you're online, uh, the, the seemingly efficient rationality of both the micro and the macro choices is completely contingent on the designed architecture of the electronic contracting environment and the scale and scope of its deployment. Each incremental micro-level click is caught be may be cost-benefit justified, perfectly rational given the context and how it's engineered, and proceeding down this path, path habitually over the course of many such interactions may also be cost-benefit justified and perfectly rational, given the number of times we encounter the same stimuli under seemingly similar conditions, our behavior becomes routine, our complacency stable, and extensions to new contexts seem normal and acceptable. Now another complication we, we highlight in the paper, and that I think is, is, is a difficult one, uh, is the very definition of choice. When we make decisions in the electronic contracting context, whether to click or not, it remains unclear whether we're exercising judgment and making a genuine choice. Uh, the environment may be designed to stimulate instinctive heuristic thinking, uh, yet the user may feel or be led to believe that she's engaged in rational deliberation. In the moment or even in hindsight, the stimulus response behavior is simply clicking is, after all, perfectly rational, and so we might very well, when we look back on it, think that it's the product of deliberation, even if it wasn't. Now, it might be counterintuitive. You all may be sort of wondering about this, to equate rational behavior with scripted or programmed behavior, because the former seems good and the latter seems bad. But the two characterizations aren't mutually exclusive. Neither is inherently good nor inherently bad. Uh, it, it completely depends on the context. Sometimes following a script is perfectly rational. We're all, we all do so every day. You're all sitting patiently listening to me rant on precisely because that's what's normal to do in this scripted situation of what we do in a talk. Right? But we all do that. That's what social norms, that's what we do on a regular basis. Sometimes it's perfectly rational to follow a script. We have to. What makes the electronic contracting environment special may be that it's designed to make it irrational to, to reconsider or break from the, from the script um, and that it has this potential conditioning effe uh, effect on us uh, across time. One strong objection to the arguments I'm making uh, is that, hey, you know what? We've long behaved this way. We behave this is an argument about everything we say in this book, by the way. It's, it's a frequent argument uh, that, that we face, right? The behavior of automatic agreement is neither new nor unique to online contracts. Most people don't read the terms of the vast majority of offline contracts. But the counter arguments predicated on a rather subtle mistake, at least in our view. Not reading does not mean abandoning deliberation altogether. So skipping the fine print, right, in your mortgage or in the, some written contract that you enter into, doesn't mean we bypass exercising deliberative judgment or thinking altogether. We still focused on the most salient terms, right? of insurance contracts, mortgages, and whatnot. At some point during contract, contracting, we at least deliberate over the magnitude of the price. We often deliberate on the nature of the relationship we're forming and who we're forming it with. The techno-social engineering we describe affects, we claim, two basic human capabilities, or two capabilities that we think matter about, being, that matter about the fact that we're human. One is the capability to deliberate, and the second is the capability to relate to others or sociality. Uh, these are the normative stakes with which we're concerned because these capabilities seem to be fundamental and at risk of being lost through rampant techno-social engineering. 
Electronic contracting, after all, is only one of many different examples of such techno-social engineering. So the more we encounter the same kinds of engineering practices, the more our autonomy and ability to relate to, to each other may be at risk. So we discuss it in the first part of the book uh, because it's familiar, and in part because it's a decent prelude to the human-focused Turing tests. Uh, it seems like a reasonable example of a context within which we ourselves experience the feeling of behaving like a stimulus response machine, even if you hadn't thought about it prior to reading this paper. But now when you think about it, about how you're behaving, it sort of it resonates. I, I hope. You can tell me in the <laughs> whether that's correct as we're working on the work in progress, but it seems to resonate well with people in terms of rethinking something that you do on a regular basis. Okay. So uh, I'm going to sort of shift gears a little and shift into the second second part of the paper um, where we turn to Taylorism. And I'm going to kind of keep my thought, that I'm going to be brief on this and summarize some of the main points uh, because I want to get to the, the Q&A and hear your reactions and open up a discussion. So in the late 19th and 20th century, Frederick Taylor famously developed his scientific theory, or scientific management, it wasn't a theory, scientific ma theory of scientific management of humans in the workplace. So Taylor studied workers, he studied their work, he examined the mi minute details of tasks that they performed in the workplace, and based on the data collected, he uh, developed a system for optimizing their performance. Uh, and the objective for the optimization was increased efficiency and productivity. So Taylorism is one of the uh, er best early examples of data-driven innovation, sort of a buzzword that's currently in vogue in a variety of circles at the OECD and, and elsewhere. Right, data-driven innovation, but this is exactly what Taylorism was. The other thing that Taylorism uh, was is Taylorism was also a revolutionary system for techno-social engineering human beings. And it was an influential one, even though Taylorism didn't necessarily uh, thrive as a production in various uh, uh, workplaces. Uh, you know, industry has moved away from Taylorism in a variety of contexts. It nonetheless has been incredibly uh, influential in terms of uh, the logic of Taylorism and its impact on other and a variety of different contexts. Uh, we, so the human computer interface we've been calling the electronic contracting environment is, we suggest, one example of an unheralded modern extension of Taylorism outside of the workplace. There are many others. Uh, and the critical point here is that the underlying structure, logic, and effects seem to be similar if not the same. So like an idealized Taylorist workplace, that is an environment optimized to achieve efficient use of human labor and maximize productivity, the electronic contracting environment is likewise optimized to minimize transaction costs, which happen to be, in this context, largely human time and attention, sort of form of human, you could think of it as analogous to human labor. Plus, the impact on consumers seems to also have a Taylorist flavor, in the sense that consumers perform scripted routines habitually and automatically like simple stimulus response machines. This was, after all, the major one of the major critiques of Taylorism back in the 1920s, uh, in the early 19, uh, 1900s. Yet, here's an interesting thing, I think. In contrast with laborers in a Taylorist workplace who at least understood they're being managed and optimized like cogs in a machine for those eight hours a day that they were, th they were at work, perhaps, you know, and they left home and got to live not as in the Taylorist conditions, consumers seem to be blissfully unaware of the techno-social engineering. Right? So it's not necessarily the case that we, we realize as consumers that we're being treated in this way, even though you might, you might say that at least laborers did. So the electronic contracting environment, the interface, the architecture certainly evolved a lot over the last few decades. People in this room know more about it than me, and so I also look forward to hearing what, what you can tell me about, about what we have to say in this part of the paper. But our hypothesis, at least for now, is that it was optimized along the lines that Taylorism suggested, although in a more emergent and less planned fashion. So website design certainly varies considerably in terms of objectives, but with regard to the website pages associated with contracting, the main, ob the main design objectives are minimizing transaction costs, maximizing retention, minimizing perhaps design and operational costs, although that's not a major factor for, for contracting pages, and then maximizing enforceability. The electronic contracting pages of a website are typically functional and task-oriented. We distinguish between two. One, one type is, is, the, uh, is the pages that d display contract terms and conditions. And this pretty much looks exactly like it's, uh, the hard copies of offline contracts. 
That is, they're filled with legal jargon that are non-negotiable, incomprehensible to most people, right? Uh, but there is one important difference. The important difference is that online contracts suffer from bloat, cheap bloat, right? It's the marginal costs of adding additional language are negligible, vanishingly small. And so there's that much more opportunity to expand and bloat out the contract terms, right? Um, the second, the s and that, and, and that additional bloat only contributes to the decision fatigue and the opportunity costs associated with deliberation. So it reinforces, it's a design feature in the sense that it reinforces the effect of the techno-social engineering. It makes us even less likely to deliberate, stop, think, deliberate process. The second type are those pages that have an active mechanism, right, for formally entering into a contract, where the mechanism purports to satisfy the legal requirements of contract formation. Um, and so I, I, we focus, uh, uh, not like Arvin was suggesting on browser apps so much, as we focus on the click, the click to agree uh, style as a mechanism, in part because it has this, this feature uh, of an active, of this active mechanism. Um, for smartphones and tablets, you're all familiar, it's sort of a tapping mechanism. Even, even just this morning, I was talking to my co-author on a different article writing about fake news stuff, and we got, got to talking about how even the, just the actions of tapping and clicking, right, are uh, more mechanical and machine-like than perhaps typing and writing. You know, so just the, the nature of the interaction to some degree uh, has a mechanical flavor to it. But let, I'll put that aside for now. It's just sort of an aside that we, came, we were talking about this morning. Um, the design innovation of the click to agree button uh, was threefold. It does three different things that are kind of interesting. First, it forces consumers to act physically and affirmatively in a manner that creates a definitive record. And that is legally significant. It provides evidence and it has doctrinal significance in the sense that the click to contract mechanism satisfies what's called the, the, uh, the objective theory of contract. What that, what that means, is it's re and simply put, is, it, is that it bases contract formation. It does a contract exist. Uh, it bases that on objectively reasonable manifestations of assent. It's very hard to know what's in the mind of another human being. So, we all, so we're relying on external manifestations of what we're thinking and what we're feeling. So how do we know that someone consents to enter an agreement? Well, we look at some external manifestation that tells us that they meant to assent. And if what they're doing, if their actions to an obje uh, uh, to our objectively reasonable person would be, oh, that, that manifests that they're consenting to be bound, well, that's going to be sufficient, right? And so courts have generally, no, not always, but they've generally upheld click-to-agree contracts because of this, it satisfies this, this theory. The second design innovation is that it creates an obstacle or speed bump that has variable size. And not surprisingly, the most common manifestation across websites that use this mechanism is the simplest speed bump, the, the smallest speed bump, which is just the click I agree button. Of course, you could have more, right? And so design, uh, Lori Craner I know has done this in the security context, probably folks here have also done this as well. Like there's a variety of ways that you can uh, adjust uh, through design to increase transaction costs, to include speed bumps, make the bumps a little higher, make people slow down, maybe slow down and deliberate and think, right? You can have people scroll over, you can have people have to check a box and then scroll over before they click I agree. There's a variety of things you could do. But in general, the thing we see most often, it seems to be just a click, uh, the, the minimal steps. And then the third part of the design innovation is that it's aesthetically pleasing, right? So the click to contract as a design mechanism uh, is aesthetically pleasing mechanism for executing standard form contracts. So separating the two pages is critical. The fact that you have uh, the, the terms and conditions on a hidden separate page that you don't actually have to see, very ugly, right? Think about a written contract, you have all that stuff. It's not aesthetically pleasing, it's just, eh, there's a link, you can get to the terms, just click I agree. So the click I agree uh, uh, page being separate from the other page is very, is, is, is a more aesthetically appealing and user, for, in, in, for a user experience perspective, it's practically seamless. And again, those features contribute to the ease and effectiveness of the techno-social engineering. So in practice, and again, this would be something very interesting to get feedback from the people, people here. In practice, it seems to us that the click-to-contract mechanism evolved both off and on the internet in a way that 
where the optimizing logic of Taylorism seems to have taken hold. Right? So web, design, web designers and architects primarily approach the optimization problem in terms of click rates, which strongly correlate with time and attention. And they may not have understood what they were doing as an optimization problem, uh, but their basic goal is to get visitors to observe, to retain visitors, get them to observe, and then click the I agree button as soon as possible. So rules of thumb, industry custom, and so on percolate in the web design communities. And the communities perform functional equivalent of Taylor's time and motion studies. The time and motion studies were what Taylor did when he was studying workers in the factory. Right? What do they, what do they look? Well, what do web designers study? Well, how human beings interact with designed interfaces, how they perform certain predictable tasks like browsing and clicking. So you've got eye tracking, click rate, and other time and motion style web design studies that might not be framed in terms of exploitation, but of course, neither were Taylor's. Taylor's time and, mo time and motion studies weren't framed in terms of exploitation. That was a label applied later <coughs> by, by cr people critical of them. Both sets of studies are managerial, and specifically, they're aimed at developing the data necessary to scientifically manage human subjects, workers and consumers, in a designed environment so that they maximize productivity and efficiency. So we don't believe, and we don't make the claim in the paper, that click the contract me mechanism was intended to be a tool for techno-social engineering human beings, but it nonetheless may have become one, right? As, as a result of gradual optimization per pushed by a certain market logic, uh, and because of the scale and scope of its deployment as it's crept from one space to another. Now, emergent Taylorism, it seems like a oxymoron. doesn't seem to make sense because Taylor developed tools for management who would use the tools in a direct and more deliberate manner. And I think this is a fair counterargument to the position we take in this section of the paper. But I think it places too much emphasis on intentionality and managerial responsibility. So we're not making claims about the intentions of web designers. We're not attacking web designers at all. Uh, but we're focusing on the nature of the tools, how they're environmental in terms of the way that we interact with them, and their impacts on human behavior. And we're trying to question the underlying logic of optimization because of its impact on autonomy. That's more or less the gist of what's in the second part of the paper. And then the third part of the paper, which I'm going to just very, how much time do I have? I'm just going to very quickly summarize kind of when I get to Q&A. I've only got about 20, 12 minutes or something. Um, I, in fact, I won't even summarize. The gist of it is that if we're right, and we're tentative about being right, because there's a bunch of things we want to study further empirically, um, but if we're right, it would suggest that, elect that contract law, as implemented through this technological architecture, may do exactly the opposite of what contract law is supposed to do. If contract law is about enhancing human autonomy and letting us relate to each other more effectively, lowering the costs across the board for us to be able to form productive relationships, and in fact it's doing something different, which is it's devaluing our autonomy and leading us to behave automatically and habitually in a way that doesn't have us stopping and thinking and deliberating, then, it may, then we may need to either rethink the theory, maybe contract law is really supposed to be about something else, like purely about efficiency, or you know, another normative goal, or maybe we need to think about reforming contract law in practice, at least as implemented electronically in digital contracts. And then we have a couple of suggestions, which you can see that are up there at the, at the end of the slide, uh, about m how you might go about uh, thinking about legal reform. So I'll stop there, and just we can open it up for Q&A.